And in fact, in the research that we did, what it was worth, which was not tremendously controlled, because again, like most of the research in this field, it was devoted towards commercial development. It was not fully government paid or anybody else paid double blind stuff. We found that we got beta and alpha uh, driving. We found that we got doubling, tripling, and quadrupling below the alpha cutoff frequency. We found that if you reduce the brightness of the audio-visual input, that the EEG flattens out and you don't get the driving effects nearly as strongly. So when you're talking to people about uh, sound and light machines, if they run themselves at very, very low light levels, it may be that they're not getting the synchronization effect at all. And I was fascinated by Len Ock's presentation because we saw very closely that he was getting a lot of skipping of the actual EEG frequency around the target frequency of the lights until he turned up the intensity. And at that point, it then locked onto, and I and Terry Patton commented that it locked onto the frequency of the driving. So in other words, if you drive hard, then you get that frequency out. But, and I'm sure lots of the uh, uh, potential salespeople of the uh, Voyager will have encountered this, if you have a nice, uh, a nice person, uh, say the perfect example of this would be uh, a more uh, elderly lady. In England, we'd say a nice old lady. I wouldn't dare to say that in America, so I didn't say it. But if you have an individual like that, very often they're so intolerant of the light that they'll get you to turn it right down until there's no light at all, and they won't be comfortable until there's no light. Okay. If you get a young dude who's into MTV, they'll want to put a thousand watts onto the light if they possibly can. And what am I talking about here? I'm talking about something that I consider to be the crucial next step in our understanding of this modality, which is what are the psychological factors in the user which fits them for what kind of treatment? In other words, what are the individual factors in the user, the personality factors, which fit them, say, for sound and light, as opposed to cranial electrostimulation, or would make them prefer Gansfeld to sound and light, or sound and light to Gansfeld? And the answer is, we don't know. And this is a very important factor in concrete terms, because the number of returns of goods that you sell depends upon your customer satisfaction. And if you cannot predict customer satisfaction, then it's a wild card, and you don't know why these people are returning it until they actually tell you. This is a very fascinating illustration of the lack of fundamental basic research that we have in this area. So I've referred briefly to that, and the other, the other, the other thing that always makes me laugh about our industry is that we have ongoing debates about, well, are you a red light person or a white light person? Well, actually, I'm green. No, I prefer yellow. And the answer is, what do we know about red and white lights? We have a lot of debate about it, but nobody's actually done any careful experimental teasing out of what is it that makes people prefer one kind of lights to another kind of lights? What effects do they have? What kind of personalities of people would fit different light types, etc.? And I have, I'll have one or two comments about that a bit later because I've got some ideas to suggest. Now, what we found was that also uh, there was seemingly much less effect of the sound than the lights. In our own research, we never really got very convincing synchronization from sound. And I was interested to see Tom's picture of apparent synchronization from a tape, because in the work that we did, we never really got demonstrable, powerful synchronization from binaural beats or anything else. Sound-wise, that was. We got it from lights. The other thing that we often forget, which I want to sort of do as a public service here, because I forget it too, so I'm trying to remind myself, is although the right ear is connected to the left brain and the left ear to the right brain, that's not true of the eyes. The eyes have their fields split, so each eye addresses both brains. So if you have a light on in this eye, it doesn't mean that you're just addressing the left brain. And there often, there's a lot of confusion in this field. Oh, well, if the goggles are on this side, then it's the left brain. Not true, just as a kind of remark in passing. And finally, the, the other thing that we found was that the rise time of the lights made a difference. If you have something smoothly coming on and smoothly going off, it doesn't jolt all of the light receptors in the eye at the same time. 
so that there's some Japanese research showing that LEDs, light-emitting diodes, those little red lights, are more effective in producing synchronization of brain waves because they flick all the nerves on at one go. And at the same time, there's also some contradictory sort of information about preferences where it's been suggested that white lights may produce more interesting colors in the imagery than red lights. And uh, finally, there's uh, very clear indications, a friend of mine in New York seems to be really pinning this down, that short, brief pulses produce clearer types of imagery than longer pulses. And so if you change the length of the pulse, then you change the visual experience. And in fact, in my view, the, a the area of inducing imagery with sound and light is something that we haven't really taken very far at all compared to where it will go. And I'll just let that hint kind of drop. Do you want me to quickly spin through the possible applications of sound and light that I think that we could summarize? Yeah? You interested? Okay, right. Great. Thank you for saying something. That's, I really feel that there's an audience there. That's great. Well, first of all, we've talked about stress reduction, and I was fascinated to see our French friend, uh, first of all, say that France was a true reflection of the rest of Europe, which, as an English person, uh, <laughs> I think is a very interesting statement indeed. Okay, you can see that those old territorial imperatives are still there. There was a, a 1910 Times article which said, continent isolated by fog in the channel, which I thought was great, you know. <laughs> it isn't England that gets isolated, it's that kind of, you know. Okay, that's like the kind of American view of, Euro of England as that kind of, uh, Europe as that island out there somewhere to the, uh, to the, to the uh, west there. So... So we have the stress reduction as the primary usage. And in fact, when my company, uh, w um, when there was a very favorable review of sound and light technology recently in the spring, uh, in Forbes FYI, which is a sort of uh, extra supplement to the Forbes magazine, we found that we had a lot of executives who got seriously interested in this technology. And we even had people telling us great stories like, well, I was in the boardroom the other day, and the CEO came prancing in with his uh, mastermind and said, look at this, kids, it's terrific. And uh, we found that there was an incredible interest in stress reduction by upper-level management, which is exactly w appropriate and what we would expect to find. And this is a potential uh, market for this industry. And also, a very important reality check. Because remember, that's the group with the power, that's the group that can do some opinion setting. Really, it's money and academe, that, and as well as the FDA and the medical s section, which I count in with academe, who are going to validate this or attempt to destroy it. And I'm concerned that some of the claims that are made on behalf of this technology, if we don't have the research, even though the research as, the, as our brilliant presenter on cranial electrostimulation pointed out, even though the research on drugs is woefully inadequate to establish them, it is still true that we will get called to account if we don't have adequate research to underpin the claims that we make for our particular technologies. So stress reduction is the first item, and I think that we do have adequate uh, documentation of that. We can also show that we can uh, improve sleep onset, that we can get rid of insomnia to some extent. We can, there is a document that I have on me actually today where somebody presented three cases where chronic pain victims were loaned sound and light devices and reported significant increases in their well-being, decreases in their pain, etc. So pain is a possibility. We were even contacted by a self-help group who were giving each other sessions on a mastermind for depression, and this is a very interesting area, the use of sound and light for depression, which people have not, done, uh, not made much uh, noise about so far. Attention deficit disorder, this is almost becoming com commonplace. I'm in a very fortunate position because I talk to all of the therapists and the psychologists and the uh, family and child counselor people, uh, and psychiatrists in some cases, who are treating uh, people, and some of those are treating attention deficit disorder. And we are getting a lot of interest in the use of sound and light for attention deficit disorder because economically, even though you may need twice as many sessions with a sound and light machine as you would need with biofeedback to enhance beta production in an ADD teenager, because the machine is so much cheaper to buy, 
one machine is equal to about two sessions in a biofeedback clinic. So it is the treatment of choice in many ways for ADD, and it seems not to have any negative side effects, and certainly less side effects on the, uh, on the pocketbook than biofeedback. Closed head injuries we've talked about already as possibly being something which could be improved with uh, sound and light. The idea here is that what we're doing is we're attempting to improve the brain's beta wave output. And when we look at it, most cognitive deficits are associated with a decline in beta wave and an increase in low frequencies. And so that would apply not just to ADD, but also to closed head injuries, to senility, to onset of uh, senile dementias and to cognitive deficits and of course many individuals who are ex-substance abusers have various forms of cognitive deficit because they've injured their brains. Just take a walk down Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. You'll see plenty of people talking to people who aren't really there. And of course the use of these devices in addiction is another area that people haven't tried. If they really can handle not just stress reduction, but truly anxiety reduction, if they can reduce anxiety, then potentially they have a role in uh, addiction units because one of the major theories of addiction is that it's a form of self-medication to reduce the anxiety that the individual encounters in their everyday life. And then the more positive, uh, there's also a use obviously in some therapy. The whole point that Tom was making about unconscious material coming up, this is a gift to a psychotherapist who may want to use some form of uncovering technique for a resistant patient or for a patient who's not resistant but who wants to go faster, use a sound and light machine, increase their hypnotic susceptibility, improvements of hypnotic response under hypnosis, and uh, of course, as we'd mentioned from France, the use of these devices for sports performance, for peak performance in all domains, including sports. And there's lots and lots of money in sports. And so the use in sports arenas is something that clearly this industry is going to start heading for. And of course, the old favorites, creativity, intuition, and of course, the sub-variant of intuition, perhaps ESP. I was fascinated by, as an ex-parapsychologist, I was fascinated by the comments on delta brainwave uh, outputs by Anna Wise because I wondered if I could increase my uh, psychokinetic uh, subjects' abilities by training them in delta production or whether it would just put them to sleep. Interesting question. So we've, re we've talked, we've reviewed very fast some of the major factors in sound and light. Now, I, now I'm going to just tickle you with some suggestions as to what factors may determine, and I, I would like to engage you in a discussion because this is something that clearly we're, we all have a stake in this. How do you best fit the machine to the person? What factors are likely to make a difference? Well, I'm going to throw to you some suggestions that I've just thought of as a result of my observations. First of all, I would expect extroverts to like more powerful stimulation than introverts. Secondly, I would expect men to like more powerful stimulation than women. You know, how many women buy sports cars, how many men buy sports cars. Second, uh, next, I would expect that the Myers-Briggs type categories, that is extroversion, introversion, and then the difference between people who are sensing or intuitives, people who are plugged into the outside world as it really is, or people who are interested in the inner world, the representation of the universe, those kinds of differences to make a difference. I would expect there to be a difference across thinking and feeling people. Maybe feeling people prefer it to thinking people because thinking people don't want to let go of their rational functions. And of course, I would expect it also to, uh, uh, there to be a differential in preference between people who have an external and an internal locus of control. That is, is the power in the outside world or is the power in me? Interestingly, psychotechnology bridges that. That's one of the points of criticism from the meditational and spiritual practices community that we are vesting power in something external, in a machine, an artifact, instead of our, in our internal processes. 